Extra, extra. The miracle heater from the burning. Extra. Extra, extra. Thousands in healing from Bruno Groening. Extra, extra, the latest news. Read all about it. Extra, extra. Read all the latest about Bruno Groening. Extra, extra, the miracle healer. Bruno Groening, thousands seek help from him. Extra, everything about Bruno Groening. Extra, extra, the night of the great healings. Here, I'll take one. Thanks. Extra, extra. You hear more and more about this Gruning lately. I'd sure like to know what these miracle stories are all about. Oh, that's nothing. It's all a lot of nonsense. Gruning is a charlatan. He's only taking advantage of people's gullibility. And besides, his miracle healer business is ridiculous. But you don't even know the man. I can well imagine someone having extraordinary powers that bring about healing. Oh, come on. You don't really believe that nonsense, do you? I think she's right. One shouldn't judge without knowing what it's really all about. And besides, I think he looks quite nice. Well, whatever the case, it's time to finally throw some light on the matter. Somebody ought to take on the task of looking into this man Gruning and what's behind all of these alleged healings. Who knows what would all come to light? The night of the great healings. Extra. Extra. Thousands seek healing from him. Read all about it. March 1949, newspaper reports abound. A little town in Westphalia suddenly becomes the center of public attention. There is talk about an alleged miracle healer. More and more people gather in front of the home of the Holtzmann family on the Wilhelmsplatz in Herford. They want to see a certain Gröning, who is supposed to have healed a severely ill boy. Many come out of curiosity, but most are hoping for help and healing through a man completely unknown until that time. They are all taken by surprise by this phenomenon. 
but many years before, he had already predicted that these events would occur. Then one evening, he suddenly told me everything he would eventually do, that thousands of people would come to him, that he would heal, that scientists would come. And then I started to have my doubts and said, all right, that's enough, that's going too far. And then he said that I would be with him, that he would need me. That was even worse. By him sein, er bräuchte mich. Sein noch schöner. Und eines Tages war er verschwunden. Er war weg. And then one day he just disappeared. He was gone, and his wife was completely at a loss. He simply wasn't there anymore. Er war nicht mehr da. Und ich komme in dieses Flüchtlingsbüro. Then I went into this refugee office, a cigarette shop, and the shopkeeper said, have you seen the magazine yet, the new one? I don't know if it was quick or review. I don't remember what they were back then. He said, here, take a look at the title page. The Miracle Doctor of Herford. That was the first report about the Hülsmann matter in Herford. Das war die erste Reportage über die Hülsmann Sache in Herford. Und ich komme nach Hause. And I go home, and there is a letter there saying that he needs me and that I should come. Und ich fuhr nach Herford, und da war schon sozusagen Hochbetrieb. I drove to Herford, and when I rang the doorbell, there were already hundreds of people in front of the house. Everything was hermetically sealed, and no one was allowed in. Then an employee, Egon Arthur Schmidt, came and let me in. He said, Mr. Gröning is already waiting for you. After entering, I found out that he wasn't even there. He was somewhere in the Rhineland, in Fiersen, I think. Yet the backyard was filled with sick people. Im Hof hinten waren aber Kranke, und plötzlich fingen dort die Heilungen an. And suddenly, healing started in the yard, even though he wasn't present. And as we later reconstructed it, at the same time he was healing in Fiersen, the healings were also occurring there in Herford. Herford auch die Heilung. Und ich war and I was filled with awe and amazement. It affected me so deeply that tears ran down my face. And shortly thereafter he comes in and says, well, what did I tell you? Und sagt, na, was habe ich gesagt? It all began when Bruno Gröning took on the severely ill son of Mr. and Mrs. Holzmann. They invited him to visit them after hearing of Gröning's unusual powers from an acquaintance. He was suffering from progressive muscular dystrophy, lay in bed and was no longer able to get up. That was what his parents told me, and that was also common knowledge. And according to the report, it was like this. Bruno came in and said, stand up, and the child got up and afterward walked around, though in a handicapped way, but he did walk around. That's a fact that can't be denied. So that was actually the beginning of the whole story. I wasn't with him at the time when the healing occurred, but I also lived in the Hulsman house, and we were trying to organize things as much as possible. We lived in the house, and we had then also so weit eine Organisation also überhaupt machbar war. It was mainly a matter of keeping the people out of the house who were, naturally, all pushing in to be with him personally. And it was hardly possible anymore, hardly at all, you know. Ging da eigentlich schon kaum noch, ganz wenig. Ne? One of those seeking healing was Georg Novak. He had suffered for four years from continual headaches. Neither treatment by a neurologist nor months in the hospital had brought him lasting relief. He was regarded as incurable. Terrible headaches. Day and night, they just never stopped. They affected me so much that I couldn't even walk straight. And then my colleague said to me, boy, that Gröning is here, a sort of miracle healer. Go and give him a try. Then I said, if a doctor in that big hospital in Hanover can't help me, why should I go to Gröning? That's ridiculous. I'm not going to go. Oh, but there are thousands of people. It's swarming with people. The place is overflowing. Just go. You don't have to be embarrassed. Just go. They didn't speak to one another. Everything was silent and still. No one said anything. And we waited for Mr. Gröning to appear on the balcony. Meanwhile, there was always the clock on the church nearby. The bells rang, and so we always knew how late it was. And in the evening, a man appeared on the balcony, but it wasn't Mr. Gröning, it was someone else. And he told us we had to be patient, and that we had to wait for Bruno Gröning. He isn't here, he's with the severely ill. 
You've got to be patient, but he's definitely coming. Kommt ganz bestimmt. Und keiner sagte wieder was. And everyone was silent again, and the man went away, and we waited and waited, and we waited three days and three nights. And then Bruno appeared. Und dann ist der Bruno erschienen. Und als er auf dem Balkon kam, And then when he came out onto the balcony, there was, it's hard to describe, a restlessness. He's here. The excitement of it. Und dann hat er gesagt, ihr Hilfesuchenden. And then he said, you seekers of help, you seekers of healing, you, the lame, get up. You can walk. You don't have to sit in a wheelchair. You can walk. But no one stood up. And perhaps they were all still doubting. I don't know, but no one stood up. Aber es stand keiner auf. Dann hat er noch mal Then he said again, spreading his arms, Stand up, you lame, you can walk. Und dann sind sie aufgestanden. And then they stood up. I was stunned when I saw that and wasn't the only one with tears in my eyes. Wenn sie dann gesehen haben, When you've seen people stand up like that when Gröning spoke to them or when he just stood there or when he said, Stand up now, and the people stood up. Or when people with crutches threw them away and walked without them, then you can't look at such a person as a charlatan anymore. Charlatan. Betrachten. More and more people report of extraordinary healings associated with Bruno Gröning. Even people diagnosed as incurable by physicians swear by his wondrous powers. It is clear to see that Gröning only speaks to the sick people, which makes the whole thing even stranger. A reporter from the South German Sunday Post reports, It's beyond my comprehension. Bruno Gröning heals the lame, the blind, the dumb, one of the greatest phenomena of this century. That's the unanimous opinion of many experts about the Gröning case. I was a young girl, 18 years old, and I always had back pain. Actually, I'd had back pain since I was a little girl. And it got worse because I had a profession where I had to stand up. I heard about Bruno Gröning and I thought to myself, go and see for yourself. And suddenly there was a murmuring among the people there and they said, he's coming, Gröning is coming. I say, but we can't see anyone. Yes, yes, he's there, over there, way to the back. He was about 100 meters away. I stood there and thought, all right, Bruno Gröning, if you're such a great healer, then help me. I want to get rid of my back pain. And I thought of nothing else. Then I heard him speaking from afar, but I didn't understand the words. I couldn't hear them. But inside me, something was going on. I noticed that at that moment I thought, he can indeed help you. In dem Moment dachte ich, er kann wohl doch helfen. Wie ein Strom. It was like a current. I noticed it down to my little toe. It ran through my body like a current. Plötzlich ging es im Kopf los. Suddenly in my head it was like when a stocking snags and a stitch runs down. That's how it was in my spine. Two runs down into my legs and then my arms and fingers. And after that, I was relieved and said to myself, man, you feel so good now. Mensch, damit du fühlst dich so wohl. Und bin dann nach einer guten halben Stunde weggefahren, zurück wieder nach Bad Oeynhausen. And then after a good half hour, I rode my bicycle back to Bad Oeynhausen, which is a good 12 miles away, and then further on to my home, which is quite a way more, and my back pain was gone. Und meine Rückenschmerzen waren weg. Da bin ich losgelaufen und habe Bocksprünge gemacht. Then I started walking and jumped for joy, as they used to say. And I repeated, I'm healed, I'm healed, you know? And it was all gone. And I sang and I said, man, it's so great. You've never had it so good, so wonderful. And when I approached my waiting colleagues, they asked, well, what was it like? What happened to you? When I said, I'm healed and I don't have headaches anymore, they didn't believe me. And I reminded them, you were the ones who insisted that I go to see him. It's really true. You can believe me, it's true. After that, they asked me every day, have you had any headaches yet? I told them no. They also noticed that when I bent over, I didn't break out in a sweat anymore. That's right, the symptoms were gone. And since then, I haven't had any more headaches. I'm 80 years old now and still haven't had any. Und immer noch nicht. 
und kam nach Hause. Und da saß mein Vater und mein erster... I got home and my father was sitting there with my first husband. I already had a close relationship with him back then. They were playing chess. And my mother came running in because, of course, I hadn't come home at the usual time, but rather a little later. Back then, people didn't have a telephone or anything. And I was excited. They could sense it. My mother said, you were glowing when you came in. Looking back, naturally, we talked about it. Im Nachhinein haben wir uns natürlich darüber unterhalten. Und ich habe dann zu ihr gesagt, es ist also was ganz Wunderbares passiert. Und alle drei schauten mich nur an und ich erzählte... I told her, something really wonderful has happened. And all three of them just looked at me as I told the story, just as I'm telling it now. And then my former husband, my first husband, said, what nonsense. Und da hab, spürte ich so richtig so den Zorn in mir aufsteigen. And then I felt myself getting really angry. But I didn't say anything. I turned around and I went out thinking, he's wrong. My back pain is gone. Als Dankeschön habe ich ihn... To thank him, I laid out some provisions, something for him to eat. He got sacks and sacks of mail every day. They lay at his door, and I put the food next to them. Coffee, butter, sausage, and so on. Und da habe ich das denn daneben gestellt. Kaffee und Butter und Wurst und so weiter. In Herford fing es langsam an, dass... The mail here in Herford gradually started to come in sacks. And we couldn't begin to open and process all that post. There was no way, no personnel at all for that. We couldn't keep up with it. It was put into sacks, set aside in the corner, more or less, and it was also impossible to handle specific letters. Letters of petition came for Gröning from all over Germany. They even came from abroad. The stream of healing seekers doesn't let up. Ja, ich wurde im Jahr 1943 an Bord eines U-Bootes verwundet. Yes, I was wounded in 1943 on board a submarine. My left elbow joint was shattered, and I was brought to the naval hospital at Stralsund, where I was operated on. Operation stattfand. Nach der Operation After the operation, they found that my arm couldn't be moved and remained bent. They tried to stretch my arm with a sandbag. Den Arm zu strecken, durch den Verstärken. Because of the stiff arm, I was unfit for submarine duty. I was like that until 1949. Man kannte mich nicht anders. That was how people knew me. I was often just called the one-armed man, because it looked as though my left arm was artificial. Durch einen Vetter meiner Frau wurde ich auf Bruno Gröning aufmerksam gemacht, der mich bat. My wife's cousin told me about Bruno Gröning and said I should go to him for my own good. He even took me there. Brachte mich auch dorthin. Gröning betrat den Raum. Er war kleiner, als ich mir vorgestellt hatte. Gröning entered the room. He was smaller than I had imagined and spoke with us, holding a short speech, a religious one, and kept pointing out that God had given him the power to help. Kraft gegeben hätte, zu helfen. Und dann... Uh and then, after he'd spoken a good quarter of an hour or 20 minutes, he asked us if we could feel anything. Unfortunately, I had to answer no. The other men, I think there were two, had felt something. The one in the leg, the other in the neck. And then I left the Hülsmann house after Gröning asked me to show up again. Aus Hülsmann verlassen, wurde zwar von Gröning aufgefordert, mich dann nochmal sehen zu lassen. Ich bin dann nach Hause gegangen. Then I went home and I entered downstairs. I felt less observed there. That's probably why I went in through the cellar and not through the house, not through the front door. Then I tried to straighten my arm, which had been like that for years, and it became straight. Und er wurde gerade. Und habe dann nur geschrien. And then I could only yell, I can move it, I can move it. Bin dann die zwei Treppen hoch. I went the two flights up to our hallway door and knocked on the pane over and over again with my right hand, paying no attention to the bell, just knocking on the door, yelling over and over, I can move it, I can move it. Natürlich war sehr kritisch. Naturally, I was very critical. I didn't know which pigeonhole to put it in. As far as I knew, it could be hypnosis or suggestion, you know? A couple of possibilities came to mind where I might put it, but it didn't fit in them. It was simply something completely different that I just never experienced before and couldn't fit into my existing knowledge. 
It didn't work. People couldn't figure it out. A person they'd seen going around for years with a stiff arm could suddenly move it. Then the question naturally arose, how did that happen? And then I actually always spoke in favour of grinning and said I hadn't believed it beforehand, but had been convinced through my own healing that he was able to do something with me that the medical doctors just hadn't been able to. Friedrich Sensmeyer had suffered from chronic inflammation of the sciatic nerve. For months he had been in severe pain and finally was only able to walk with a cane and was unable to work. The physicians were at a loss and expected long-term paralysis. His son-in-law remembers. The treatment had naturally gone on for over two months, but there was no improvement. Finally, he came to the point at which he simply said, I can't walk anymore. We were naturally taken aback, but the doctor couldn't tell us anything either about what could be done or what the problem was. Mr. Jakschitz went to the Wilhelmsplatz in Hereford with his father-in-law. Bruno Gröning addresses the seekers of healing again. However, they stay there only half an hour. Friedrich Sensmeyer considers the whole thing nonsense. When I got home the next day, my wife says, I have a surprise for you. I say, what's happened now? Well, your father-in-law is in the garden digging. I say, say, do you have a screw loose? I didn't really mean it. But yesterday, he was deathly ill. I'm telling you, go on and look for yourself. I couldn't believe it. He really was digging. I say, what are you doing? You'll get worse. No, he says. As you can see, I'm digging and have no pain. I say, Grandpa, you're pretending, or do you somehow imagine? When I tell you, I also don't have my cane. Well, where is it? In the kitchen. How did you get out here? Well, he says, like this, out to the garden, and got my spade and started to dig. What I then absolutely had to know was, would it continue? And after about three months, there was still nothing, nothing at all. And he then went back to work. And I thought, that's impossible. The rush to Bruno Gröning continues to grow. Some see in him a new messiah, others consider him a charlatan. The medical profession, above all, proves to be more than skeptical about the Gröning phenomenon. My father is or was a physician, and, well, there were many doctor's sons among my friends in the neighborhood, and we had some intense discussions at my house about the charlatan. Of course, with traditional medicine versus miracle healer, there was bound to be trouble. And I often went with him to the Wilhelmsplatz. You also saw a lot of physicians there watching attentively, naturally shaking their heads with a certain lack of understanding, and perhaps also with a little professional jealousy. So we saw a lot of the sons, my friends after all, with their fathers. And I tell you, and I can't change it, but there were also many physicians there, and they argued, but with absolute disapproval and none of them showed the slightest bit of understanding. The medical profession pressures the city. The mayor then declares on May the 3rd, 1949, a temporary healing prohibition against Bruno Gröning. The confusion over the so-called miracle healer gradually comes to a head. He, on the other hand, visits Superintendent Kunst to discuss the situation. He hopes to be helped by him. I believe that altogether I spoke with him at length four times. I didn't consider him a charlatan. I considered him a serious man. For me, it was unquestionable that powers went out from him that caused healing in people. For me, the decisive thing in such matters was that God has many ways to help people. Dimension to help. 
On May the 13th, 1949, there is a conference of the Hereford City Administration with a Medical Examination and Control Commission that was called together to advise on the Gröning case. Present are the Chief City Director Meister, Superintendent Kunst and high-ranking physicians. The conversation was not particularly friendly. Naturally, the gentleman arrived with a high degree of mistrust. We then separated and the city acted in a way it felt to be correct. The fundamental prohibition on healing against Bruno Gröning is maintained. During these days, seekers of healing storm the Hereford City Hall. He himself follows the call of other people in the surrounding towns. As a child, I suffered from heart problems. They were so bad that I would have to sit up in bed night after night. My mother would often call a doctor at night because I was in danger of suffocating. And the physician, Dr. Kamsmeyer from Hiddenhausen, had diagnosed a heart valve defect from which I would have to suffer my entire life. Er hat dann also eine Diagnose gestellt, also das ist ein Herzklappenfehler. Und äh, dass ich also da mein Leben, Leben lang drunter leiden müsste. Ich durfte also auch zu der Therefore, Zeit, at the time, I wasn't allowed to do any sports in school. I was always there on the sidelines when it came to sports. My health was so bad that I thought I wouldn't last much longer. Bot sich dann die Gelegenheit. Es war also so schlimm, dass ich also das, ähm, dass ich also gedacht habe, es, es dauert nicht mehr lange, nicht? Und dann bot sich dann die Gelegenheit bei Bruno Gröning. Und äh, ich bin dann. Then the opportunity came with Bruno Gröning, and so I went into this house where he was in the Lower Wiesen Street, and then I. I cried. I still remember it exactly, and said, Mr. Gröning, can you help me too? I've got heart trouble. Ich hab's mit dem Herzen und so. Und dann sagt er, ja, mein Sohn, sagt er. Ja, mein and then Sohn. he said, yes, my son. And he put his hand there on my chest and on my head and said, yes, my son, you can go now. You are healthy now. Then I went out and cried. My mother was standing out there. I said, Mother, I don't have any heart trouble anymore. Then I cried and it was really over with. I could sleep. I was in my 14th year and from that day on, I've been healthy and I'll be 60 next year. I also played sports again. For example, at school back then, we played kickball. And then I played sports again. There was nothing, there was nothing more. There were no more health problems. The healing has lasted. It has simply lasted until today. Es hat angehalten. Es hat einfach angehalten bis heute. Also meine Mutter hatte Lungenembolie und mit ihrer... My mother had a pulmonary embolism and always had difficulties with her bowel movements. And now she had lain for six or seven weeks without a bowel movement, no excretion. It was as follows. The doctors had given her an enema, etc., but nothing had moved. So the bowels were dead. One can say they had gone numb. My mother was so swollen, she had developed such a belly. You can imagine when nothing had come out for seven weeks. So the doctors gave up. They couldn't help anymore. Then, when Mr. Gröning was with us, he said to me, bring me a glass of water. So I fetched some water at the pump. So, Mrs. Grafarend, take one or two swallows now. And my mother drank. So, he said, do you know what you have just drunk? Your new blood, which is now running through your veins. Bruno Gröning often emphasizes that a person's blood is contaminated. He, on the other hand, is able to transform it through the power of God and thus enable healing. And when I came home from work, I was from work, I was 
And when I came home the next day, my father had stayed home from work, and then he started talking. I have never experienced such a thing in all my life, he said. I've got about seven basins full of what mother got rid of, and everything came out. Everything was cleansed. And then my father said, Mr. Gröning, what do I owe you? Nothing at all, he said. It's just that the medical profession is in turmoil and is against me, and can't understand that the sick are being healed where traditional medicine fails. Dass die Kranken geheilt werden und die Schulmedizin versagt darauf. Aber er hat war ganz ruhig und nicht das. But Bruno was very calm and was not spiteful towards the physicians. It's only that they want to get rid of me. And if you would write a documentary report, and Father wrote four pages the next day. Er hat Vater an einem Tag vier Seiten geschrieben. Bruno Gröning considers it important to document his activity. Thus, many letters of thanks and healing reports from that time have been preserved. The doctor came again the next day. He came every day with a nurse to have a look. The doctor made a place on the bed and sat down. Mrs. Garfarend, I have never before seen an illness disappear so suddenly. And that was the gist of what he said. And so we were overjoyed. And my mother <coughs> lived in good health for another 20 years, for which we are all grateful. On June the 7th, 1949, a total prohibition to heal for all of North Rhine-Westphalia is proclaimed against Bruno Gröning. His assistants, Egon Arthur Schmidt and Erich Kuhlmann, inform the crowd. The situation becomes worse and worse for Gröning. All his efforts to be allowed to speak to the healing seekers are thwarted. So the people became angry about the prohibition on healing. What happened then? There was the confrontation with the city director, I think that was what he was called, and with the police. And then the people protested because they wanted to forbid him his activity. So actually everything was always in a state of flux. Egon Arthur Schmidt, who documents these events in Hereford in his book The Miracle Healings of Bruno Gröning, writes of the dramatic development in those days. In spite of the prohibition, more and more seekers of healing came from afar. The pressure on the authorities by those people who were in profound physical and emotional misery became stronger and stronger. Delegations were formed almost daily, which even went to the private quarters of the then incumbent deputy city director, Wehrmann. I grant Gröning permission to heal, effective for this evening. Wehrmann yeah. succeeds in calming the crowd and in causing them to retreat. However, the hope and joy of the help seekers is short-lived. The prohibition is effective again the very next day. In the end, Gröning's hands are tied. He is greatly disappointed over the lack of understanding for himself and his activity. He acts accordingly and leaves Hereford, but not without leaving behind a lasting impression. 
Ja, er hat eigentlich eine Epoche auf diesem Gebiet eingeleitet, würde ich sagen. Yes, he actually initiated a new era of spiritual healing. With very few exceptions, he was actually I don't know of anyone at all who did spiritual healing and he was a pioneer because he got the ball rolling. You can follow exactly how it went, how suddenly it became a topic of discussion. And it wasn't like that at all before, except in a few theosophical or anthroposophical and esoteric publications that had already been around at that time. But that was it. But he brought it to the public. It became a subject of public discussion. And then later, something that the scientists were concerned with. Öffentliches Diskussionsthema, wo sich dann nachher Wissenschaftler mit beschäftigten. Das fing damit an, dass meine Frau in einer Zeitung oder in einer Zeitschrift einen Artikel... It started when my wife read an article on Gröning and his activities in a newspaper or magazine. She handed me this article and said, maybe you should really do a report about that, which we can publish in the review. Well, we weren't the editors, just the publishers. But still, the editors were very interested in accepting our recommendation war die Redaktion sehr interessiert daran, unseren Vorschlag zu akzeptieren. They made the initial contact with Gröning. The review correspondents Heinz Bongartz and Helmut Lauchs are to take over the journalistic side of the matter. The review decides to contribute to the scientific clarification of the Gröning phenomenon. Research on the healing method of the miracle doctor is to be conducted at the Ludolf Krehl Klinik in Heidelberg under the patronage of Professor Dr. Weizsäcker. Above all, the Marburg psychologist and physician, Professor Dr. H. G. Fischer, is responsible for the scientific investigations. They promise to give Bruno Gröning a certificate if the result is positive. That is supposed to pave the way for him to work freely. Here they were going to test whether he could heal or not. That was the purpose. It was supposed to be an absolutely clinical test to prove his ability to heal. That was the purpose. And he agreed to that and said, yes, I'll do it. And we went to a villa in Heidelberg in a kind of closed test. That is, he wasn't allowed to carry out healing anywhere else, but only with patients brought to him by the university clinic. First of all, the fundamentals of the Gröning phenomenon are investigated. Above all, the focal point is the scientific examination. However, Mr. Kindler is very quickly impressed by Bruno Gröning. Nun ja, ich glaube, der Dünkel einer Gruppe von Ärzten, die erstens aufgrund ihrer akademischen I believe that they were simply an arrogant group of physicians who thought that they knew everything in the area of human illness based upon their academic and scholarly education. And they were naturally stunned that here was a man to whom people literally rushed without his doing anything. And that there weren't five patients, nor twenty, nor fifty, nor a hundred, but rather thousands of patients who flocked to this man. That's hard for a doctor to understand. It really is hard to understand, and for them especially. And he had no training as a healing practitioner. He had none at all. He wasn't stupid. He was intelligent. He was no intellectual, but he was intelligent and not stupid, and could express himself clearly and intelligibly. And, as I said, he took the trouble to speak to people. But he was no chatterbox, on the other hand. My God, I don't want to imply that. No, not at all. That wouldn't be in line with his humility. No, no, no. So, I think that the doctors just thought, well, all that's simply unbelievable. After all, we should be able to do it better than him. And so we'll shut him up in the adjacent room and have our patients come, and then he can come to them. Then we'll surely get to the bottom of all this. He's perhaps just a charlatan, after all. Maybe it's all coincidence, perhaps only mass suggestion. But I wouldn't believe that. From hundreds of letters of request, patients are chosen from the Ludolf Krehl Clinic. After that, these patients were brought into the villa and later seated in a circle. He stood in the middle. Back then, there were huge tape recorders and everything was recorded on tape from an adjacent room. 
It took a great deal of technical effort. It wasn't as simple as today. And several doctors were around to take blood pressure and pulse. Done. And then Bruno Gröning began. But I can remember only one case. It was a female patient with chronic constipation, a constipation which couldn't be helped. And during the treatment, it started and she had to go out. The success with Elsa Joost is made public in the newspapers as an extraordinary event. The most impressive, however, was the Strobel case. He had suffered for years from Bechterow's disease, which had led to a total stiffening of his spine. In addition, he was plagued by severe pain while walking and climbing stairs. Within a very short time, he is free of pain and can move about freely. Mr. Zelda, who was also a patient from Heidelberg, was examined by Professor Dr. Weizsäcker and diagnosed with a serious nerve disease and chronic inflammation of the spinal cord. Mr. Zelda was able to stand up for only a few minutes before collapsing. He was given only five years to live. One evening, while we were sitting in a circle in the hall, he suddenly stood up, said nothing, and went out. I looked and looked. Where was he going? And there he was going up this wide, steep, winding staircase, up to the first floor. That was an open stairway all the way up, and there he was going up the stairs all by himself, like a completely healthy person. When we arrived there, he couldn't have done that. And then he came back down without stopping. He just pranced down the stairs and then carried out his regular work until he was 65, completely normal. The doctors appeared impressed. In the review, Professor Dr. Fischer comments very favorably in a preliminary opinion on the results of the Heidelberg investigations. He attributes Gröning's obvious successes to a natural talent. However, he attempts to explain everything from a psychological point of view, although the healing of the Bechterus disease in the Strobel case, for example, can hardly be placed in this category. He says Bruno Gröning is not a charlatan, nor a hypnotist, nor a miracle doctor. He is rather a talented non-medical psychotherapist. He makes the effort to help people with their emotionally caused ailments out of a childlike, natural empathy that also has a religious basis. He doesn't claim to be a prophet or messiah, but he has a devout sense of mission. Professor Dr. Fischer then makes Gröning an offer that he does not, however, accept. Gröning wants to remain true to himself and his path and doesn't want to be restricted. He later writes in retrospect about this. Sanatoriums were supposed to be put at my disposal in which physicians too would be working. This was so that all cases could be checked in the greatest detail so that further confirmation would be available not only for the public but also for the medical profession. Professor Fisher, however, demanded from me a monthly salary of 3,000 marks plus high daily expenses. And in addition, I was supposed to obligate myself to hand over to Professor Fisher 30% of all the beds. This was because, as he explained to me later, he would be able to register 30% of all those healed as healed by him. That is, be able to clock up 30% of all those healed under his name and as being due to the effect of psychotherapy. I wasn't able to declare myself in agreement with this suggestion of Professor Fisher and rejected it because I, one, didn't have a single cent with which I would have been able to fulfill my financial obligations toward him, and two, had never considered making a business out of the whole project. Several physicians and professors, I didn't notice all their names, wanted to win over Gröning for the treatment of their patients. But naturally, that turned out to be for their own profit. And Gröning once said, He who has received this talent, it is a gift from God and cannot be sold. As soon as I accept money, this gift will be extinguished. Geld annehme, erlischt diese Gabe. 
Gröning's refusal is interpreted negatively. He doesn't receive the promised certificate. Suddenly they say that his secret has been discovered. Gröning remains misunderstood. The review experiment has ended. We didn't do only glossy magazines at that time. We had already begun to set up the book publishing. And you can see a little of what we published and that I was naturally very interested in psychology. Over there is the 15-volume work, The Psychology of the 20th Century. So I am familiar with the subject matter. But Gröning is a one-time phenomenon who couldn't be classified in any psychotherapeutic or psychological school. I say I think he was a deeply religious person. But I also had the impression that a group of doctors, I don't want to generalise, a group of doctors wanted to use him and did use him and exploited his knowledge. But his knowledge was not to be fathomed. So they weren't able to learn to do the same things that he had done. It remains a secret. Gröning once said in connection with this, It isn't right that the very people who don't grasp anything consider themselves knowledgeable and therefore can't grasp what knowledge is. That the ways of science haven't been 100% correct is proven alone by the number of scientists who suppressed their feelings and allowed the intellect to speak instead. I certainly can't be understood by the intellect. Eines Tages sucht er uns auf, um sich mit uns über das, was er vorhat oder nicht vorhat, zu beraten. Und wir hatten damals ein Haus. One day he visited us to talk about what he was or was not planning. And at the time we had a house in Munich with a big garden. And the house was also still serving as our publishing headquarters. He came there, but before he came one day, I don't know any more the day of the week, let's say we had an appointment at about three o'clock, but people who wanted to come into our house were already gathering there at one or two o'clock. But I attempted to prevent that because I didn't want to embarrass him. Moreover, the police had also turned up and they were probably supposed to assure that he didn't appear there. Well, they were standing out there in front of the gate. We had locked the gate because we were thinking of the prohibition and didn't want any difficulties for ourselves. But above all, not for Gröning. We knew that he already had enough trouble. When he arrived around three o'clock and the gate was opened, the people, the number of which had meanwhile increased, nevertheless streamed into the garden. The police hadn't prevented it, nor, of course, had we, for we had no desire to get the crowd worked up. So we were concerned with the somewhat unpleasant thought that people were standing there who weren't to be let in, you know. Schöner Gedanke, der uns da beschäftigte, dass da Menschen standen, die man nicht reinließ. Ja? Nun gut, also sie kamen. All right, so they came in and were in the garden. And we went with Gröning into the house and sat down, my wife, he and myself. And the three of us held an intensive conversation, the details of which I can no longer exactly remember, or of which I can only remember little, if anything. But my impression was that a humble, believable, good-natured, cooperative man was sitting there, that we would gladly help if it were at all possible for us. And I remember a small detail, that I was sitting there with crossed legs, and I don't know how, but the conversation turned to bodily functions. And he said, would permit himself to say, perhaps one should, perhaps I shouldn't do that. That wouldn't be for the, that wouldn't be organically good. It would be better if I just sat there in a casual way. I think that he might be right. Well, then the conversation naturally turned finally to the prohibition against him. Basically, what could one do? Which lawyer could handle it and so forth? But above all, should I go out and tell the people, please go home? I say, we can't treat the people like that. And he was of the same opinion. He also said, I can't get around the fact that people want to speak to me. But on the other hand, I have to conform to the prohibition. 
So I'll go out and say something, namely that I just can't say anything. And that's what happened. I took him outside. In the garden, we had a big swimming pool, a square one, but without water. It wasn't filled at the time. And on one side of the pool, there were some steps going to a little hill with a little sitting area. Gab es eine kleine Treppe zu einer kleinen Erhöhung zu einem kleinen Gartensitzplatz. Dorthin brachten meine Frau. My wife and I took him there, expecting him to go up the few steps and address the crowd around the pool from there and tell them how sorry he was. Schreiende Menge zu sprechen, zu sagen, wie leid es ihm tut. Aber siehe da, er blieb stehen. But see, he stopped didn't go up the few steps and instead went down into the swimming pool, the dry swimming pool. In den trockenen swimming pool. Das fanden wir. Das hat we found that, that touched us immediately. And I must say, I find it also psychologically so interesting that instead of speaking to the people from above, as we'd expected, he went down and spoke up to the people around him. Zu den ihn umgebenden Menschen spricht. Es war eine große Stille. It was very still, and he just said how sorry he was and how much he hoped that it would change again, that he would be allowed to devote himself to patients. But today he couldn't do that yet, and that they should understand that he could not act in violation of the prohibition. But then he said he'd like to say goodbye and moved toward people who were especially in need of him, on stretchers and in wheelchairs, and gave them his hand, saying, get well soon. And in the in den Rollstuhl. Und den gab er die Hand und wünschte ihnen gute Besserung. Und siehe da, einer von den... And see, one of the people lying on a stretcher got up and said, I'm well, I'm well. And in the wheelchairs, admittedly, people do often sit in wheelchairs who are only partially, who just can't walk properly. In any case, several stood up from the wheelchairs and it was deeply moving to watch. Next to me was a physician who turned toward me and said, as a physician, one is ashamed of one's helplessness. Und sagte, als Arzt schämt man sich ob seiner Hilflosigkeit. In the time that follows, more and more people wonder about Gröning's origins. In various biographical statements, he writes, I was born in Gdansk, Oliver, on May the 30th, 1906, to August and Margareta Gröning as the fourth child of seven siblings. During my childhood and youth, I gradually came to the conclusion that I had special abilities, which, radiating out from me, tended to have a calming or healing influence on people and animals. My relationship with the family was strange and tense. However, my imprisonment in the family house didn't last long because I early and very often freed myself from it. The woods and my friends, the animals, were so strong that they kept pulling me toward them. There I experienced God in every shrub, in every tree, in every animal, even in the rocks. After a short time there, I'd feel secure, for there I wasn't so alone. I also came to the conclusion as a child that animals usually considered shy or vicious were good-natured and tame when with me. I spoke with all animals. In short, we got along very well together. Wherever I was, I could stop and contemplate, and it always seemed to me as if my entire inner life broadened into an eternity. In the family home, there was very little understanding towards little Bruno. He was often beaten and dismissed as crazy. Bruno is my cousin. My parents said that as a small boy, he was already a strange sort, as they say. He went walking in the woods a lot, and one day he started collecting bread. 
His parents wondered why, and he said that he had to collect and dry out the bread to bury in the woods, because he believed, or that's what he said, that a war was coming and that they'd need something to eat. His parents were surprised by that, but didn't think much about it because he was a little different from his siblings anyway. In an affidavit in the year 1949, August Gröning said of his son Bruno, he was even able to predict certain events, such as the beginning and end of the First World War. He also predicted the death of his mother, as well as the beginning of the Second World War in 1939. He saw and predicted it all. He also had a characteristic that enabled him to heal people from illness and relieve suffering. And it was also very interesting for us to hear about such things, about when he was a little boy. His mother even took him along to hospitals because the patients asked, bring little Bruno along. When he comes to us and sits here and talks to us, such a profound calm comes over us and we feel much better. Mother, can you still hear me? Grandma, you won't die. You're healthy. Bruno Groening continues in his biographical writings even when I was a small child, people were freed from their illnesses in my presence. So I was continuously attracted directly to sick people. I attended public school. After discharge from there, I started a commercial apprenticeship. I was there two and a half years. I had to give up that training at the request of my father because it was my father's wish for me to learn a building trade. I followed the wish of my father and learned carpentry. However, I didn't graduate with examination because at that time in Gdansk, there was high unemployment. For this reason, I had to give up my training three months before graduation because the firm where I trained had to close due to insufficient orders. Later, people often reproach Bruno Gröning for not being able to complete his vocational training in the turmoil of that time, regarding it as a sign of instability and incompetence. In 1925, the 19-year-old was able to establish a carpentry and furniture shop and became self-employed. He was able to keep the business going for two years, but was then forced to give it up due to the bad economic situation in Gdansk. After that, he tried, like many others in the difficult time between the two world wars, to earn money as best he could, and was willing to do any kind of work. I carried out all those jobs with interest, and I especially wanted to undergo an apprenticeship in which I could study the knowledge and know-how of people in all situations and on all social levels, and learn how they structured their lives. I sought not only the poorest of the poor, but also the richest of the rich to learn how they lived. Max Brun, an early friend of Gröning, remembers. It was in 1931 when I urgently needed living space for my family. The search led us to the house in Gdansk Langfuhr, 77 Ring Street, number two. We were taken in and were given one of the rooms in the two-room flat where Bruno Gröning lived. Even back then, Bruno Gröning never thought of himself. His supreme commandment was to help his fellow men and give them new strength. 
To him it didn't matter whether the person was seeking health or needed some other help. Even then he was often called to go to sick people. But he would never take a penny for it, regardless of what the problem was. On the contrary, he would even give these people his own last cent. But I would also like to especially emphasize one thing. It concerns the things that have happened in the world in the past years, including the partition of Germany. Even the beginning and the entire course of the war have taken place precisely as Bruno Gröning predicted. Ernst Korn also testified to Gröning's extraordinary abilities. Mr. Bruno Gröning had already helped many people through the forces radiating from him, making prognoses that were always correct. I experienced Bruno Gröning's healing power during our years as neighbours in Gdansk Langfur. I was often freed from pain. When the Second World War broke out, Bruno Gröning was 33 years old. He himself regarded the war as a clear sign of how far man had separated himself from God. He remembers in his biographical statements. I was inducted into the army in 1943 at the age of 37. There was trouble because of my attitude. For example, a court-martial was considered because I had stated, whether you send me to the front or not, I will shoot no person. Bruno Gröning was taken prisoner by the Russians on March the 5th, 1945. There too, he is supposed to have healed many fellow prisoners. Since he minced no words with the camp administration and stood up for better living conditions for his fellow prisoners, he was regarded as rebellious. As Gröning later reported, however, a few Russian officers stood up for him and saved him from being shot. He had me einmal gesagt, he once said to me, when I was a Russian prisoner of war, I made life easier for many of my comrades. And the Russians themselves came to me and said, you're a second Rasputin. Sie sind ein zweiter Rasputin. Ich habe Herrn Leis, der auch im Gefangenenlager von Bruno Gröning war. I knew Mr. Leis, who had also been in the prison camp where Bruno Gröning was, very well and he confirmed that Bruno Gröning had even then helped many people who experienced recovery and help, and that he had been through a lot with him. Und hat vieles mit ihm erlebt. Auf der Heimfahrt von der Gefangenschaft im, im Eisenbahnwagen. Da ist, ist mir der Bruno Gröning begegnet. So I met Bruno Gröning on the train when returning home from imprisonment. We even lay next to one another. Not right away, but after a time, he told me all the things he could do and that he was a miracle healer. And he told me all about what he would eventually do. And when we finally separated, he again told me more things. And then I said, you're crazy. You've got a screw loose. Okay, du spinnst ja, du hast ja einen Vogel. Okay. In December 1945, Gröning was released from the prisoner of war camp. He picked up his wife and went to Dillenburg. However, she didn't want to hear anything about his healing abilities, and a short time later told him that he had to choose between her and the help seekers. That led to a separation. Bruno Gröning continues in his biographical writings. In West Germany, I set up, along with other refugees, the Organization for Displaced Persons. I was also a member of the Housing Commission, for I felt obligated to help the people further. The war had left deep scars everywhere. Its devastating consequences were just becoming visible. 17 hours of incessant attack. All the people were lying on the ground. Then the next day, or during the night, I'm not sure anymore, my hand was paralyzed. I couldn't bring a spoon to my mouth anymore. The shock, you know? The shock, you know? And it wasn't that I was crying over the loss of property. You have to be happy that at least you weren't burned up with the house. And my lame hand was treated as well as possible, but it was still lame. 
Aber sie war immer noch gelebt. After the turbulent days in Herford and the scientific investigations in Heidelberg, Bruno Gröning is invited by Mr. Harvard in August 1949 to his stud farm, the Traberhof, near Rosenheim. He wants to withdraw here for a while to avoid the tumult surrounding him. At first, he succeeds in keeping his stay a secret. However, after the first newspapers report on his arrival in Bavaria, the news spreads like wildfire. Well, it really looks very good, Mrs. Bernhardt. I think with the tablets we'll soon have it under control. But I've already been taking them so long. I realise that, Mrs. Bernhardt. Just trust me. Well, get well soon and stop by again next week. Thank you, Doctor. Heinz, I have to speak with you right now. Well, Fritz, you can't just simply... You won't believe what's happened. What's the matter? I was in Rosenheim today. Take a seat first. I was in Rosenheim today at the Traberhof. You won't believe what was going on there. There were thousands of people and Gröning. Oh, God, that Gröning. Are you going to start with that again? There were so many sick people there in wheelchairs and on stretchers, and suddenly, suddenly some of them stood oh, up. Oh, no, stop it. But they could really walk Fritz. again. Fritz, pull yourself together. That's all just a faked show. But I saw it with my own they eyes. They get paid for it. They only pretend to be healed. Don't let them make a fool of you. When I was in Munich, I telephoned the Traberhof immediately. It happened that Mr. Kuhlmann came to the telephone. I told him that I was interested as a healing practitioner and student of Dr. Schmidt. Then he said, we are happy when such people come and observe us. Well, more and more people came. More and more people until there were thousands. I would guess up to 5,000, you know. It was hard to estimate. And then the healings took place again, perhaps an even greater number. One always had the impression, the more people, the more healings. press starts a big fuss. The reports are numerous. They report in a sensational style and the Trauerhof is now called the Bavarian Lourdes. As a result, there are soon mass gatherings. The Trauerhof becomes the rallying point for countless seekers of healing. The Trauerhof suddenly becomes Gröning's first healing center. Reports of sensational healings are heard everywhere. He just looked at me, like this, and I showed him my hand, so more or less. And then, I don't know, was there a table there or something? In any case, I had my hand like this, and suddenly my fingers were drumming, like drum fire a long time. I can't do it as fast now as I did then. And at that moment, the paralysis was gone. It went away within half an hour, really. We were both happy, because he was always so glad when he could personally experience it so quickly. And that was really a great gift for me. None of the applications had helped. The herbal baths, medication, exercises, nothing had helped. The shock from that night of bombing had remained so deep within my joints. Yes, one can really speak of a special healing. Da kann man wirklich von einer besonderen Heilung sprechen. The Traberhof becomes a world event. On some days, up to 30,000 people gather on the grounds of the stud farm. People also travel from abroad to see Gröning. After the turmoil of wartime, the sick and suffering see hope here again and ask for help and healing. I went on my motorcycle to the Traberhof. In Schlossberg, I picked up my aunt who also wanted to come. We stood way in the back, 
and about 10,000 people were there. I don't remember. It was an incredible number. When he came out under the balcony, it was already dark and the lanterns had already been lit. He came out and sort of looked around and said, Hey, Michel is here. Michel is here. Come up here to me right away. Yeah, come look right up to me. This was, this, this was for me take the wonder. This for me, that was a real miracle. I was doing well again at that time. But when I left the prison camp, I had very short hair and weighed 96 pounds. And so, nee, ganz mager, mit 96 Pfund. Das, das, das war das, das, der Höhepunkt für mich, wie er mir als der Mensch. That was the greatest moment for me, the way he found me in the crowd. And I was standing way in the back with my aunt. And he said, Michel is here, Michel is here. Come up here to me, right away. You can't imagine finding me among such a mass of people, even if he had been able to find me there a month afterward. But it was five years afterward. He went forward to the front door and the police were there and didn't want to let me go up. Then I said, I'm the one he called to go up. And then they didn't want to let my aunt go along. So I said, if she can't go with me, I won't go up either. So they let her in. Then I went in and he said, do you remember how you said I was crazy and had a screw loose? That was the first thing he said to me. I said, yes, I still remember that very well. He said, I told you that you would read a lot about me in the newspaper. And that is what happened. Even the weekly newsreel reports on the events at the Traberhof. Today's new catchword, Bruno Gruning. The man who attracted attention with his strange healings in Herford, Westphalia, has meanwhile moved to Rosenheim in Upper Bavaria. Since then, the crowds of healing seekers and the curious have been camping day and night in front of the Traberhof, Gruning's current residence and workplace. Gruning's special powers, the revelation of his previous successes and the faith of his followers, often causing ecstasy, have rendered the Gruning case a much-discussed phenomenon. Science is taking a cautious stand above all in regard to the lasting effects of Gruning's healings. Scenes like this are the side effects of the Gruning cult often brought about by the effect of other influences. Yet, they all wait hour by hour, often day by day. People with all kinds of ailments squat in gloomy, silent rows, and only when Gruning appears does this review of misery break ranks. Gruning's appearance on the balcony is the moment they've been waiting for, a strange, dubious phenomenon of our times. I by the infantry as hunger. I was severely wounded on July 4th, 1943, as a radio man in the infantry. It would be too much to list the individual wounds that I had. In any case, I was severely wounded. The most important thing was my brain injury. I was shot in the head, and the fragment was operated out in 1946. But the essential thing was that I was partially paralyzed on the left side. My whole body was filled with pain, and I had a terrible time walking. So all I could do was stumble along. Meanwhile, I went for treatment at the brain injury center in Munich. However, the head physician, Dr. Volnia, a very good doctor, was unable to help me at the time. He tried something new every day with medication, with massage and the like, gymnastics, everything was tried. In the end, he used morphine, but that too didn't work. And then suddenly, I read one evening as I was returning from devotions, I saw a comrade of mine sitting at the window in front of me reading a tabloid newspaper with the big headline, Bruno Gröning helped me. That fascinated me so much, somehow the thought of Gröning. So I spoke to my comrade and asked him if he wouldn't accompany me the next day. He went to Rosenheim by train and got off. I didn't know where Gröning was, where the so-called Traberhof that was written about was supposed to be, didn't know anything. I also didn't know whether Gröning was there. And on leaving the station, we saw many people with canes or crutches going in a particular direction. Then I said to my comrade, 
Hey, we've also got to go that way. We came to the Traberhof and there were already a few thousand people waiting for Gröning. No one knew whether he was there or not. If you stood on the balcony, you could see only people. It was crawling with people. Unimaginable. So full, I tell you. It was hard to even get to the house at all. Gröning came through the door onto the balcony and first leaned against the balcony railing, leaning with both arms spread out wide. I will never forget that picture. For me, his build nicht mehr wegzudenken. Und, uh, hat Bruno Gröning die Menschen and then Bruno Gröning greeted the crowd, saying, Please, position yourselves so that you aren't touching one another. That took some time, as it was very difficult, because there were so many people and all so close together. We had to spread out so that no one touched anyone else. We held our hands stretched downwards and were really very still. You could have heard a pin drop, despite the many people. It was really unbelievable. As he stood there on the balcony, I had the impression that he was conscious of his mission. That was what gave him the strength and power. He said a lot, but for my ears the most important thing was, you must believe in God and you should trust me. Everything else was just so many words, understand? That became the foundation of his work. The following occurred in my body. I became very hot inside, felt my blood so strongly and felt my pulse so strongly. It beat as if, so to say, I heard the pulse of the blood running through my body. I became incredibly warm and it was such a strange feeling, the likes of which I had never before experienced nor have ever since. In any case, from that moment on, I felt better. That revealed itself only after the healing when we left to travel back. I was able to take normal steps again, instead of just stumbling along as before. My colleague no longer had to lead me. I could walk normally. I even carried my cane part of the time and walked freely without it. My comrade said, what are you doing there? I said, I feel so good that I can walk without the cane. He was astonished. And when we returned, the news spread very quickly. Everyone knew about it and was surprised that I was suddenly able to walk again like that. From that moment on, the doctor didn't need to give me any more medication, no morphine, nothing. And it lasted. Since then, I've never been seriously ill. I am not here to hold big speeches, but to mediate help and healing. Don't think about your ailments. Observe your body and ask yourself, what is happening in my body? Do you feel something going through your body that you haven't felt before? I want you to know that you are all children of God. The only physician, the physician for all human beings, is our God. Only He can help. But He only helps the person who has found the path to Him, or is ready to go on that path, to take on belief and live with it. You don't have to believe in the little groaning, but you have to have trust in me and thank God for his great deed, for his great power, for his splendor. I don't want the gratitude. And so I wish all of you standing here the best of health. Throw away your illnesses and take on health. This will happen in the name of God. The best and greatest gift in this earthly life is not riches, not money, but rather health. I call you to order. I want you to lead a healthy, good life as God has intended, and to no longer associate with that monster, with evil anymore, nor to come to terms with it. No, repudiate it.
When you do all of that, only then does God begin to work in man. Order is God. Order I, is help. I, 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 I can see. I can, I can, I can see. I can see again. I can see again. I can see again. I can see again. I can still remember one case, a blind man who suddenly yelled out in the crowd, I can see, I can see. Well, I brought him up to know for sure. After all, it was after dark. I said something like, how many windows are lit in that house? And so on and so forth. And he answered me. Später habe ich diesen Mann dann, weil wir Zeugen mal für einen Prozess brauchten, in München, irgendwo hatte ich seine Adresse. And later I visited that man because we needed witnesses for a lawsuit in Munich. I was somehow able to get his address. It was a really primitive hut, sort of a little cottage. He was busy hanging wallpaper. Obviously, he was able to see, you know? Sicherlich konnte er sehen, ne? Was ich gesehen habe, das waren die Rollstuhlfahrer. Und da ist also... What I saw were the people in wheelchairs. And there were quite a number. I don't remember anymore how many who actually followed Gröning's command and got up out of the wheelchairs and push the wheelchairs themselves. That's what I saw. A Hungarian woman, I assume she was a gypsy, fell to her knees and with clenched fists screamed again and again, thank you, Gröning, thank you, Gröning. Then I spoke to her and asked what she had had. So she showed me that both her hands had been paralyzed, but she was still very young, early 20s, very chic, very elegant for after the war, and then she could suddenly spread her hands out again. Im Pferdegestüt am Gatter habe ich mich da bisschen zum Ausruhen angelehnt. Sitzmöglichkeiten gab es ja nicht. I was leaning on the fence of a stud farm to rest a little. There was no place to sit, you see, when a man came up to the hurdle and wanted to jump over it. And I said, why are you here? And then he jumped over. It was at least a meter high, or 1.2 meters. He placed a hand on the hurdle and jumped over it. I said, you're out of place here. What are you doing here? I've been here the whole week. It must have been Thursday or Friday. And on Sunday I was here the first time, and suddenly I can walk. I said, that's impossible. No, it isn't, he said. I was lame. And he opened his wallet and showed me a photo of himself severely handicapped. And he was pictured on two crutches. He said, it's been four or five days, and I can walk. Don't need crutches anymore. And he said, now it's been four or five days, and I can go. I don't need any crutches anymore. Sonst hätte ich, wenn er mir nicht Otherwise, I wouldn't have believed him if he hadn't shown me his ID. Oh, was he ever beaming with joy. I tell you, he had a lot of energy. He was at least 50. To jump over the hurdle, not even all young people can do that. That was really impressive. At that time, a great documentary film is made on Bruno Gröning and the extraordinary events at the Traberhof. Rolf Engler is responsible for the direction and production. The film is supposed to depict the events in an objective, informative way. News of further healing continues undiminished. Herr Pavel had multiple sclerosis. Mr. Bavai had multiple sclerosis, and during the war he was sent from one hospital to another. No one could help him. It was so bad that he could no longer work after the war. They had fled to Rosenheim from the Sudetenland. Sie waren aus dem Sudetenland geflüchtet nach Rosenheim. Seine Krankheit war so weit fortgeschritten, dass er nur noch sitzen konnte. His illness had progressed so far that he could do no more than sit. He could barely stand, and when he shaved, he had to hold one arm with the other in order to do it. Dass er das vollführen konnte, die Tätigkeiten. Ich war öfter mal bei ihr gewesen und sah, wie... I was often at her house, and I saw how sick her husband was. He was only able to move forward from the bed to the table. Someone had to hold his hand so that he could bring a spoon to his mouth. 
So he was a very, very, I would say, deathly ill person who was just vegetating away. Ein todkranker Mensch, der nur so dahin vegetierte. Er stand mit seiner Frau am Traberhof unter Tausenden von Menschen. Alle warteten. He was standing with his wife among the thousands of people at the Traberhof. Like them, everyone was waiting for Bruno Gröning. And then it was said that Bruno Gröning had to go away. Mrs. Bavai left her husband and went quickly over to where the car with Bruno Gröning was starting. Gröning startete. Und sie rief, Herr Gröning, ich bitte Sie, helfen Sie meinem Mann. She Und called out, Mr. Gröning, please help my husband. She asked from the bottom of her heart. And he reached out from the car and held her hand firmly. And she ran along as the car started to move. And he finally said, he will be helped. Es wird ihm geholfen sein. Es war ihr diese Begegnung mit Bruno Gröning so wertvoll, dass er ihre Hand gehalten hat. This encounter with Bruno Gröning meant so much to her because he had held her hand. Automatically holding up her hand and arm, she fought her way back through the crowd to her husband and said, Well, my dear, this hand has just held the hand of Bruno Gröning. And she gave him her right hand. Und in dem Augenblick ist ihm eine Kraft zugefügt. And in that instant, a power entered him and took over his entire body. And he felt so good that he suddenly had the feeling that he was free from burdens, illnesses, and handicaps. He was able to walk to the train. Er konnte zum Zug laufen. Mein Mann hatte mir von der Fabrik oft irgendeinen Jungen geschickt. My husband often used to send a boy from the factory to give me messages. We had no telephone. So when someone knocked at the door, I said, just come on in, Max. And suddenly there was Mr. Bavai standing before me. I said, have you just run up the stairs? He said, yes, that was me. I said, but that can't be. I've been healed, and I'll have a lot of trouble. I have to go to various physicians, have to report everything. Since I'm well, they'll stop the pension that I've been getting because of the illness. I can take on a job again any time. So we were naturally all speechless. Denn ich bin ja gesund. Ich kann ja ohne weiteres wieder einen Beruf ergreifen. Also wir waren natürlich alle sprachlos. Mr. Bavai's success report is also taken down in an affidavit in order to document the special events. Later, he even becomes a close associate of Gröning. His old ailments never return. Many other people report of similar phenomena. When I was 14 years old, I contracted phlebitis. I sometimes fainted from the pain. As a result of the phlebitis, I got a pulmonary embolism, blood clots in the lung. After three days, I was unconscious and the doctor gave me shots. At night, I sat in bed and couldn't get any air. The doctors advised amputation of my leg because that's what was causing the blood congestion. That's what they recommended. I didn't want that at all. I didn't want to live anymore. <laughs> it seemed impossible that anything could help. Mr. Wanderwitz is one of the many healing seekers at the Trauerhof. He stands in the midst of the crowd, hoping that perhaps he can still be helped through Bruno Gröning. So ungefähr eine Stunde, da ist mir so gut gegangen und wir haben mich gefühlt und leicht und after about an hour, I felt so good. I felt so calm and light. The internal pressure and all the pain were gone. From then on, it went very well for me. I was able to sleep at night again. I didn't have any more trouble with my heart or breathing. The village doctor that had previously treated me moved away. Later, he asked my mother if I was still living. My mother said, yes, he's doing quite well. 
He couldn't believe his ears. Ja, ja, geht's gut. Der ist von Staunen nicht mehr rausgekommen. Mm. Der war noch mit 50 Jahren. Mit 50? I once asked my mother why I hadn't been given the farm back then. The doctors had said I would only live to be 30 to 35 at the most. Ja, aber die Ärzte haben gesagt, ich wäre höchstens 30, 35 Jahre alt. <lacht> Darum habe ich da aber einen Hofen nicht gekriegt. Countless healing reports from that time testify to the variety of healings. Elisabeth Schwert had been deaf in her right ear for 20 years. She is healed, although the doctor treating her had declared that it would be impossible for her to regain her hearing. Mrs. Lohschelders is healed from Besteru's disease. At the Traberhof, Hugo Pacholke is healed from rheumatism and sciatica of long duration. The 57-year-old Senta Saltner is cured of the stuttering that she has had since she was six. Mrs. Kozinosmina is healed from the neuralgic pain she has had for 10 years. Hans Schonauer is healed from multiple sclerosis of 11 years duration. He now walks easily without a cane. Lena Brandl is also healed. She had had inflammation of both hip joints for 10 years and had been declared incurable. Johann Schäfer is healed from a very painful duodenal growth and a severe gastroptosis of 13 years duration. Paula Bema is cured of a severe heart ailment. Johanna Bayer suffered from asthma for 20 years and had such shortness of breath that her heart was in danger of failing. Her healing is even confirmed by doctors. Franz Neerkorn had spinal polio for 30 years. His healing is also medically confirmed. On August the 31st, 1949, Bruno Gröning holds a press conference which he himself called in the gaming room of the Traberhof. He asks the journalists to report objectively and truthfully and to stop further sensational reporting. A short time later, a positive attitude of the Bavarian ministry towards the Groening case is published in several newspapers. Prime Minister Erhardt declares that one shouldn't allow the work of an extraordinary phenomenon such as Bruno Groening to fail through legalistic nitpicking. Groening's healing activity is regarded as a free activity of love. Meanwhile, the healings at the Traberhof continue. Im Ort da war a Frau, die war blind. There was a blind woman in the town, a Mrs. Haberland. A person in the neighboring town was blinded in the First World War. They said, I should take them along. When I arrived, he said to me, I told you not to bring anyone with you. I said, they begged me so that I couldn't say no. Sind die im draußen im 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 Flur im, im Korridor da draußen? Da war ein ein Ding. A man. In the uh, corridor out there was an opening with a curtain, and outside there was a bench where they both sat. Haben sie die zwei Hand da drauf gesetzt? Und dann ist er rausgegangen. He came out and he peeked through the curtain. He held the curtain around his face like this. Came back in and said to me, "The woman can already see again." But the man can't see. His optic nerves were destroyed in the war. The woman can see again, but she still has to come again often. I was curious too and went through the curtain to her. Then the woman said to me, Yes, Michel, I can see again. A white Spitz dog is running around out there. They had a white Spitz at the Traberhof. Now, I have to go to the bathroom right away, she said. She could see again. I went down to the cafe where her son and son in law were. I told them that their mother could see again and they were very happy. And then something strange happened. 
He had become very tired, and in the room there was a wing chair. He sat there totally exhausted, really exhausted. Then Mr. Kuhlmann quietly creeps up to him and says, Please, Mr. Gurning, look. There is an ambulance down there, a double-decker. He waited a little while and slowly got up. Then I went over to him. I was sitting only about as far as you are from me. And I stood up and said, Mr. Gruning, may I accompany you? He said, it would be a pleasure. Please stay behind me. Bleiben Sie bitte hinter mir. Also dann blieb ich die ganze Zeit hinter ihm. So I stayed behind him the whole time and witnessed how he, he wasn't very tall, slipped into this double-decker bus with the severely ill. They were the poorest of the poor, and he was so loving to them. He kneeled down and spoke with them. I'll never forget it. You could sense his love. Ich werde das nie vergessen. Man spürt es in die Liebe. In time, many German physicians turned to Gröning. They addressed the uneducated man with great respect. Dr. Erwin Perleg, general practitioner, asked Gröning in the name of several severely ill patients to visit his practice. Dr. Guido Roth, general practitioner, requests help for his daughter, who is suffering from polio. Dr. A. Kaufmann, surgeon, gynecologist and radiologist, wants to visit Gröning with a special patient of his. Dr. Josef Keifel, general practitioner and homeopath, makes a formal request for an audience with Gröning for two patients. Dr. A. Molena, general practitioner, writes, Dear Mr. Gröning, since I, as a general practitioner, have among my sick patients several who you could certainly help, and who without your help would hardly have a chance to get well and would continue to be bedridden, I am inquiring as to whether I can bring these sick people to you, or if you could come to us. Dr. Oscar Fate asked Groening to visit his Kneipp Naturopathic Institute. The German Healing Practitioner Union in Schleswig-Holstein requests a remote healing from Groening. The League for Natural Healing writes, Dear Mr. Gröning, we have followed closely all of the reports on your work up to now and sincerely hope that the authorities will soon come to an appropriate understanding with you too. The representatives of folk medicine in particular can testify to the prejudice with which the German bureaucracy has behaved for years in this field. Dr. Zetti too turns to Gröning. He had a very positive attitude, Dr. Zetti, and Gröning had also been to his practice. Dr. Zetti had often gone to the Traberhof, and he was very impressed and was absolutely convinced. That's the best way to express it. Dr. Zetti, a general practitioner from Munich, had already made contact with Gröning. He writes in an article, the groaning phenomenon interested me as a physician so much that I have already spent many weeks, many days, but also many nights at Gröning's side. Through personal contact and the greatest concentration, he is able to heal or at least provide relief to the sick with the most severe ailments within a short time, among them even the blind. I've witnessed it myself. We had so much fear. Um for example, we often had, I think it was at the Traberhof, Jesuits from the Jesuit College, which still existed near Munich at that time, but no longer today. There were a lot of Jesuits there who asked him religious questions, who conversed with him about religious problems. Just think about it. They're people who are 100% educated in the subject and have tremendous knowledge, but they were incredibly interested in him. And there's the story of the monk from Assisi. He was a Franciscan, came from Rome, and he'd either been ordained as a priest or was about to be ordained. I don't remember anymore. I only know that he gave a very positive speech. I can't give any of the details. I don't remember anymore. Ansprache hält. Ich kann im Einzelnen dazu nichts mehr sagen. Das weiß ich nicht mehr. I also conversed with him, 
and he was very enthusiastic about Bruno. It was incredible for him, and he expressed himself very enthusiastically and asked Bruno for his blessing. Him, a priest. Yeah, it's priest done. The speech of the Franciscan was recorded in shorthand. He says, I am deeply moved by the words of Mr. Gröning, and I must admit that I am reminded of the words in the scriptures. By their fruits ye shall know them. The divine saviour says that in relation to such people. And the fruit is good. The evil of mankind is very great. They persecuted Christ and they persecuted his disciples. And they have persecuted all those, even pious priests, who have healed the sick in the name of God. Therefore, have courage and faith, and do what Mr. Gröning tells you. And when physicians and scholars who are opposed to him answer that he has no degree behind him, it is laughable, for God doesn't allow himself to be told what to do. With them. As Bruno's healing ceremonies were thus far concluded, the Catholic and Protestant priests began to sing the hymn, Great God, we praise thee, and all the people there on the field sang along. It was incredibly touching. Traberhof has now been a place of pilgrimage for some time. Due to the news of countless healings attributed to Bruno Gröning, the people are moved and take on hope again. The reports spread like wildfire throughout Germany. Even abroad, Gröning is no longer an unknown. Whether out of curiosity, a longing for the sensational, or a genuine desire for healing, the people stream in ever-growing swarms to the Traberhof, that which he himself had never strived for but which had been triggered by the sensational reporting of the media, now reaches its climax. The mass gatherings, however, also awaken the forces of opposition. Soon, the tide will have turned for Bruno Gröning. <laughs> 